All right, good morning again, everyone. Good to see all of you today. Ushers have sermon notes. If you want them, just raise your hand. You can get them there or on our digital app. You have the digital notes that you can do that way. Uh, For years, a lot of uh, big companies will give back to charities, but normally they don't do churches. And we just found out this year in the last month or so, Amazon has opened up that you can give through Smile, Amazon Smile, and uh, half a percent of whatever you spend uh, goes back to now, they opened it up to churches. So on your way out, you're going to get a little card. We'll show you how to do that. And then we're designating anything that comes in that way is going to go to mission. So we did hear some rumors that some of you shop on Amazon during the Christmas season. So we thought this might be, be a good way also for us to, to get back. So you don't have to do anything different. You just go through the Amazon smile side. Uh, on your phones, at least on the Apple phone, you'll have to go through a browser. There's not, on the, if, you're, if you're a... The other phones, it works well. But anyway, we won't get into that battle today. All right. Second, uh, next week we have a guest with us. And uh, last week we showed you a little bit about what it looks like inside when he's, he's doing his, his thing. And, and I don't know if he's going to walk the hallways doing this, but this will give you a little more idea about Jared Hall and uh, what we'll be going through next week with him. Come on, man. in his shoe. It was crazy. One, two, three, four blank cards. Wave like this, spider webs. One, two, three, four, spider webs. See, we can actually create a spider. Wave your hand over this right here. Wave your hand over. Just like this. I call this the five dollar trick, though, right? You can turn them into twenty. See, like this. You can turn them into. What? Five dollars. Oh my! Oh my! Look, we can turn. So Jared's a little trickster, you can tell. Had some fun. Also be sharing a story, a little bit of testimony, a little bit of the word next week. Great chance just to bring someone who maybe doesn't go to church or maybe they do and they're looking for a church and maybe you can share some of these videos that we'll put online as well. All right, we're going to dive into the message today. It's our last week in a series called Through It All. And today our title is Through It All, God is Working. I don't know if you've ever been betrayed by somebody and then like they, they kind of hold all the power and then all of a sudden the tables turn and now you're like the one holding all the cards and it's like God has set you up for a payback moment. That is exactly where we find Joseph in our series. It's like now he has all the power and, and, and we're going to find that he responds a little bit differently than, than maybe many, many of us in our world would respond. So again, we're using Joseph as a backdrop to talk about how do we navigate through all the seasons of life, the good, the bad, the ugly, all these things. And, and we find in Joseph kind of all from work to family to, to success, we, we found some things to talk about. But it started, to do a little recap, as, as a 17-year-old teenager, Joseph was a dreamer. And we told that he had two different dreams where his entire family and his brothers are, are bowing, it, Scripture says, low to him. I mean, like they are, they're just kind of going, they're just as low as they can go. And, and the brothers hate this. They don't like what it represents. They don't like Joseph as a person. And, and this, this dream, these dreams begin a series of events in Joseph's life. And he has favor from his father. He's, he's hated by his siblings. His, his dreams are then shattered as he is betrayed, sold into slavery. His dad thinks he's dead. There's no rescue mission. And as a slave at his lowest point, Scripture reminds us that each of us, even at our lowest points, it says this, the Lord was with Joseph. And he's put in charge then of Potiphar's house and, and has great favor there. Then he experiences injustice as he is accused of rape and falsely and then put into prison. Again, Scripture then says the Lord was with Joseph in the prison. And while he's put in charge there, he notices two guys are, they're, you know, they're their frowns are, their smiles are upside down and they're frowning and having a bad day. And, and he helps two guys interpret their dream. And, and in one of them, he says, hey, when you're restored into Pharaoh's court, would you remember me? And the guy forgets about him. And we talked about how God, when we go through pe- moments where, where we think we're forgotten, that God is still with us. And, and then in a, in a miraculous moment, he goes from 
from the prison to Pharaoh's palace as he's asked to interpret a dream and he tells him, Pharaoh, there's a severe drought on the horizon and, and Pharaoh looks at him and is like, I can't believe what I'm hearing and, and I can't believe what I'm seeing and he, and he says to everyone who's around him, on this guy right here, I recognize something special. On him is the spirit of God. And we talked about, hey, did people in your life realize that and notice that the spirit of God is on your, in your life? So he has now placed in charge of all of Egypt. For seven years, Joseph prepares for the coming drought. And last week at the end, we said it's not just Egypt that he saves, but the entire area of that world is now coming to Joseph asking for food. And we said that God will sometimes use you to reach the regions of your world and people will be coming to see you. So Genesis 42, when Jacob, that would be Joseph's father, when Jacob heard that grain was available in Egypt, he says to his sons, why are you standing around looking at one another? He, dad still talk the same way today, don't they? Well, just get moving, you guys. I've heard there's grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy enough grain to keep us alive. Otherwise, we'll die. So Joseph's 10 older brothers went down to Egypt to buy grain. But Jacob would not let his youngest brother, Joseph's youngest brother, Benjamin, go with him for fear that some harm might come to him. So Jacob's son arrived in Egypt along with the others to buy the food, for there was a famine in Canaan as well. And since Joseph was governor of all of Egypt, in charge of selling grain to all the people, it was to him the brothers came. When they arrived, check this out, they bowed before him with their faces to the ground. The brothers don't recognize Joseph, but Joseph recognized his brothers instantly. I don't know why, but there's three dad jokes that are just burning in me. I got to get them out. They keep going through my mind. All right. First of all, some people have thought that tennis was invented right here because Joseph served in Pharaoh's court. That is not true. Okay. That's one. That's one. Really bad. Hopefully, we're starting better. Here's the second one. Um, it's a good thing that Joseph was honest, especially in Egypt because they in all of his financial dealings, because if anyone would recognize the pyramid scheme, it'd be them. That's my second one. Okay. So when the boos and laughs are about equal, I know I'm doing pretty well. So the third one, the reason the brothers did not recognize Joseph is because they had just walked by the river denial. The, oh, I said it wrong. Shoot, I'm done. No. I, mm, all right, we'll keep going. Blew it. Take me off the road. As if no one's like, you're not going anywhere with that kind of stuff. All right, here we go. So Joseph is face to face with his brothers, the ones who sold them into slavery. And when he sees them, you know, you know what are they doing? They are bowing low before him. Their faces to the ground. Now, it's impossible to exaggerate how offended the brothers were when Joseph presented them the dreams. And, 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 and they don't know it's Joseph, but he recognizes this moment. And they beg him for food and they beg him for help. And, and would you save our lives? And it's at this moment, Joseph can get even, right? You know, a lot of us, if we're in that moment, we're going to hold back a little bit. We're not going to jump in. We're, we're for sure maybe going to get a little bit of revenge. And, 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 and like he can return the favor. They left him for dead. He has all the power, but instead he tests them. He's like, on the fly, I got to figure out if the character in them is, 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 is what it should be. So he begins to grill them about their family. He accuses them of being spies. And in Genesis 42, verse 10, they say, No, my Lord, your servants have simply come to buy food. And then he says, they say this, We are all brothers, members of the same family. We are honest men. And I'm sure Joseph's like, Oh, really? I'm here. I know what you did to me. I kind of find that hard to believe. Well, they tell him, you know, we come from a good family. We're 12 brothers. You know, our youngest one isn't here. And then the other one's no longer with us. And Joseph, yeah, I know that. And kind of the irony is real thick here. And at this point, Joseph is overcome with emotion. And Scripture says he leaves and just breaks down crying. Because you can imagine the, the turmoil inside of him. Now, there's no Instagram at that point. There's no Facebook to go check. Hey, what's going on with this, the brothers? And, and Joseph, again, he wants to know their integrity. He wants to know their character. And he wants to know, is Benjamin really alive? Is he not? Is his dad alive? So he says, I'm keeping one of you here and I want you to go back, and when you need more grain, bring your brother's brother Benjamin back so I can see him. 
So they go home, and, and Jacob hears about this, and he is sick with worry about losing another son, and, and finally he sends them back Benjamin. By the way, when they left, Joseph put all their money back in a bag, and he's like, I'm going to see how honest these guys are. Sends them, Jacob sends all the money back so they can, can return it and then actually buy some more, and then Benjamin shows up <clears throat> before Joseph. And Joseph sees that Benjamin is actually alive, and verse 30 says, Joseph, when he saw this, hurried from the room because he was overcome with emotion for his brother, and he went into his private room where he broke down and wept. Joseph, there's just, again, this, this, all of this emotion here. And Joseph then prepares a feast, and when they come to the feast, the brothers are all seated with their names in the order in which they were born, and they're kind of freaking out about this, like, how is this possible? What's going on here? Joseph puts the money back in their sacks again, puts his own personal chalice in Benjamin's sack, sends him out, and on the road, he sends out the captain of the palace guard and says, go get them and bring them back because they've stolen some stuff. So they go there and, and, and they say, someone's stolen the, the silver chalice. And the brother's like, no, 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 no one did that. And whoever you find that in, you know, they could be put to death. And sure enough, it's Benjamin. They find that in. So all of them come back. What, what Joseph has a plan. He's trying to say, when Benjamin gets in a difficult spot, are they going to fight for him or are they going to just let him go like they did me? Because it would have been easy in that moment just to try to cover this up. So Genesis 44, they're all brought back. Joseph was still in his place when Judah and his brothers arrived and they fell to the ground before him again. Judah makes an impassioned plea for Benjamin, my Lord, I cannot go back to my father without the boy. Our father's life is bound up in the boy's life. If he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die. We, your servants, will indeed be responsible for sending that grieving white-haired man to his grave. My Lord, I guarantee you, I guaranteed my father that I would take care of the boy. And I told him, if I don't bring him back to you, I will bear the blame forever. So please, my Lord, let me stay here as a slave instead of the boy. Let the boy return to his brothers. For how can I return to my father if the boy is not with me? I could not bear to see the anguish on my father's face. Joseph can't take it any longer. And he realizes, this is, is my thought, is something has changed in his brothers and now it's okay. He's going to reveal himself to them. Verse 1 of chapter 45, Joseph could not stand any longer. There were many people in the room and he said to his attendants, get out, all of you. So he was alone with his brothers and when he told them who he was. And then he broke down and wept. And he wept so loudly the Egyptians could hear him and word of it quickly carried, carried to Pharaoh's place. And he said, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was actually standing in front of them. Please come closer, he said. So they came closer and he said again, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery. Don't be upset. Don't be angry with yourselves for selling me in this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. The famine's two years. It's going to be five years more. There'll be no more plowing, no more harvesting. And God has sent me ahead to keep you and your families alive. Now hurry back, tell my father, this is what your son Joseph said. God has made me master over all the land of Egypt, so come down to me immediately. So I would imagine in the brothers, there's this mixture of like, yes, and then as they're going, they're like, oh, we gotta tell our dad this whole little story, like surprise and prank, you know, you know they're like, what do you say? I mean, that'd be just terrible. By the way, we, 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 he's not dead, and it was all this thing, and we had this, and talk about a big piece of humble pie, right? So that's our, our backdrop. So now let's kind of bring it back to, to where, where we're living this morning, because this whole series is about letting us understand that you have the ability to grow and to change your character and to develop even in good times and in bad. So what we learn from Joseph is this, through it all... As we will trust and surrender, God is working. And it kind of works in companionship with one another. As we trust and surrender, we can understand that God is working behind the scenes. If we try to take some matters into our own hands, we can then stop God from moving on our behalf. So, so we want to just trust and surrender. We keep living our lives. We keep doing what we're doing. But we're telling God every day, I'm trusting you in this situation. I might not like it. I might not understand it. But I'm surrendering it to you. And God, would you do your work? Because I don't know how to do this. And Joseph finds himself over and over in this situation. I can't control anything right now. I can't get to a different spot. I can't be promoted. But I'm going to trust in you. So the key to our growth is actually our own trust 
faithfulness and surrender. So as we, we, we look at this story, it starts with Joseph and the dream of the brothers bowing before Joseph. They want nothing to do with it. It ends with the humility with them and will, willingly and humbly bowing before Joseph as he holds their life in his hands. That's the two ends of the story. The middle is all about Joseph trusting and surrendering and growing into the kind of man that God has called him to be. So I, I don't know where, where you may find yourself at today as you walk through these doors, but I, I would guess that some of us are really struggling to give God control. There are some things in our life where we don't like, we don't understand, and we're kind of maybe even blaming God about it. And, and it's often the part where we flat out reject God and we're saying, God, I don't want to tell you, you to tell me what to do. I don't want you to be Lord over the situation because I trusted you and it feels like now I'm in a bad spot. And I just want to remind you, the Lord has not abandoned you. He is with you. And, and if you're kind of feeling that way, by the way, you're not alone. Every single one of us in this room have felt that way. In fact, Scripture describes that's the feeling of pretty much everyone resistant, unwilling to surrender until at some point they humble themselves before the Lord. Isaiah says this, we all, like sheep, <clears throat> have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way. And that's talking about how, how the Messiah came and it's a Scripture about how, how, how His people surrounded and surrendered to their own will instead of His. And, and it's the beauty of our story is that the Lord, remember he, they keep saying, Lord, Lord, Lord. The Lord's not beating us into submission. And there's some parallels with Joseph here. The Lord, he, he, he is Lord over them, but all he wants to do is serve them. And this is not a story of, of brothers that, that reluctantly are, are forced into forced labor, but, but now we see them humbly bowing and they're placing their lives before Joseph saying, whatever you need, whatever we can do, and, and here's the deal, they do it because they know and that's the best thing for them. So I want to talk to you about how God works and why it's safe to surrender to him. And there's some parallels between Jesus and the story of Joseph that are really important for us to understand because the Joseph story is kind of a, a, a prequel, a preamble to what Jesus does. So number one is this. It's safe to surrender to Jesus because he serves us in love. Not in power. He has the power, but he chooses to serve us first through the filter of love. Again, when Joseph first presents this to the family, they're like, are you crazy? We're not going to bow before you. You don't, you, you, no, we're not doing that. But at the end of the story, they're actually calling him Lord and, and surrendering their lives literally to him. And in the same way, Jesus, he's come as Lord, all powerful, all knowing, all God in the flesh. And, and here's what he says. For the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus had the power, but his love motivates him to serve. You know, all of us, we want power, but power corrupts us if we, if we don't have the right heart. So Jesus is telling us, hey, if you're in a position of power, what are you using that for? Because it needs to be to serve the people around you. And the Son of Man's like, I got all the power in the world, but I'm here to serve you. I'm here to, to love you. And it's love is, that is our, our motivation for doing that love changes our need for power, and it actually changes us when we're in a position of power. In this case, for Joseph, it leads him, his love, to withstand his moments in slavery, to withstand his moments in prison, and love begins to shine through in all of those situations. And now, as his brothers stand before him, instead of revenge, what do we see come out of his heart in the midst of his power position is love. Second, he forgives and restores us. You can imagine Joseph, what's, what's he, he forgives and restores. And the parallel in Joseph's story to Jesus is really, really amazing. So let's fast forward. So we just looked at chapter 45. We're going to jump all the way to chapter 50. And we're kind of doing a time warp because 17 years have passed. All right, so you got that? Everyone, 17 years have passed. Genesis 50. When Joseph's brothers saw that their dad was dead, they're like, oh boy, here it comes. It's hammer time. You know, bad things are happening right now. And they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs that have been done? Because now dad's, dad's gone. And he's the one holding back. By the way, in times of death is some of the greatest family trauma that can happen. You guys have maybe seen it. The, the, the wills come and different things happen and you're not taking care of this and you're not taking care of that or I deserve this. And, and this is kind of, and, and the same thing was happening way back then. The brothers are like, oh no, 
Now we're in trouble because here's, here's what's happening. What if he holds a, a grudge against us? So they sent word to Joseph saying, hey, dad left these instructions before he died. You might want to take a look at them before you do anything. Uh, this is what you're to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of, of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. They didn't understand his heart. They didn't understand what he had offered them before. And he's kind of like he's brokenhearted because here he had been in good faith this whole time and now, now they're again kind of saying, we don't know if we trust you. His brothers then came and they threw themselves down before him. Look at this, what they said. We are your slaves, they said. We'll do anything to serve you. We'll do anything to salvage a relationship with you. And Joseph is, has already forgiven them, but here they are cowering in fear before him. Why? Because they knew they didn't deserve to be forgiven. They didn't deserve the grace that was given them. Have you ever felt that way towards the Lord? And some of us, it can kind of get twisted. And we think, you know, I don't deserve God's grace. It's one of the reasons why people don't come to church. I don't deserve to be in his presence. Another thing that can happen to us, and it can twist us, is that I have to do all of these things in order to get God's approval so I'm just going to kind of work it off like a slave. And God's like, no, no, I love you because of who you are. Don't do things out of duty. Let's do things because it's a relationship. Let's do things because you want to do this. And, and, and they're, they're like, don't hurt us. We'll earn our keep. Help us. And Joseph, again, weeps when he hears this. And he said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. So don't be afraid. I'm going to provide for you and your children, and he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. And you can imagine, again, Joseph's words as, as he begins to see the portrait of his life change because his family, while they, they sent him to die, was actually saved by that action. You know, God can take some of the worst things and turn them around, and you're like, how did that just happen? And this moment, again, is nothing like they first imagined. Never did they a moment they're going to bow before Joseph with gratitude, and yet here they are. At the end of the story, surrendering, and it's the exact place they need to be. Some of us, we want to do it all ourselves. We want to have it our way every time with God. And the end of the rope is this. When you surrender to God, it's the exact place you need to be. And I just encourage you, don't wait. Don't go way down the road and, and have a lot more issues. Surrender to Him now because He's got the best things in store for you. And I, I don't know the hurts of, of every person in this room, but Joseph experienced some of the scariest, some of the worst things you can imagine, betrayed by those closest to him, dehumanized, exchanged for money, left for dead. And I can't imagine the context of, of his pain, but some of us maybe can in this room. Some of us have experienced something like this. I know a few of your stories. You're like, I, I've kind of walked that path. I, I've been betrayed. I've been in situations by, by all these things. That, and what I want you to know is this. Joseph refuses to pay back evil with evil. Something inside of him says what you intended for evil, God intended for good. God can turn it into something good. And his brothers aren't going to be able to give him back anything that was lost, never be able to repay him for anything. And Joseph just says, I can forgive you because God is able to turn our stories around. So today, there are some things I know in some of our lives that somebody intended for evil in your life. Like, and those are shocking moments. You're like, somebody did that on purpose, and I was collateral damage. Somebody approached me. Simon, I won't go into all, you know what it is. And, and what I just want you to know in this story is so powerful because God is able to then start to take that thing. He never wastes a hurt, and I'm not saying it's his will. But what he's saying is, I can take the evil that was meant for you. The enemy maybe wanted to destroy you, destroy your family. But I can turn that around into something good if you'll work with me and you'll surrender. And that's why it's so powerful. This model of how God does forgiveness is powerful because as he treats us unconditionally, we have the power to have something happen in our lives. And he, and he lets us off the hook when we can't do anything to pay it back. I heard a story about Craig Grishel. Some of you know him. He's the pastor of Life Church. They have like a thousand churches. No, they have like 40 churches in America. But uh, when he was in seminary, like they had no money. And they had, they had a, a vehicle and they had a, an extra vehicle and, 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 and someone had given it to them, I think, or it was a very cheap old car. And, and they came across someone who needed it more than them. But they didn't have the money just to give it to them because they, they just said, so they worked the deal out super cheap 
We're going to give this guy this car for 10 easy payments. He can't make the payment he needed. He got to get to work, you know, school, whatever it was. So we're just going to, we're going to make it as easy as, and he was so thankful and, and just this is going to change my life. And, and he made the first payment and then he just disappeared. Like he didn't come to church anymore, didn't, didn't answer their calls anymore and no more payments. And, and the longer it went, the more angry Craig would become. He's like, this guy robbed us. We trusted him. You know, we gave him this. We wish we had our car back, and now we don't have any money, and we're struggling to meet the bills and all this stuff. And he, he just kept getting angry. And finally, one day, his wife just said, you know, Craig, let's give him the car. He's like, he's already got the car. You know, he's just kind of, and she said, no, no, no. In our hearts, we just got to give it to him. Because this is eating us up. It's taking too much of our time, too much of our energy, and we just got to let him, let him off the hook because we're the ones actually struggling right now and just do it. And he said when they did that, it freed them in a way that they couldn't imagine. Some of us, some of the people in our lives that we're just like, I wish they and this and all that, they're gone. I mean, they're like in the witness protection program. You don't even know where they are anymore. But they have a hold on you and it's time for you just to let it go and let them off the hook say, I'm, I'm, giving, I'm giving that to God and I, or I'm giving it to them and, and Lord, you take it. And that's what God God does with us. He extends forgiveness we didn't earn. But then the last point is this. He gives an inheritance that is not deserved. The brothers don't deserve anything from Joseph, but just, I mean, it's grace that they're alive, right? But you know what Joseph does? Check out cha chapter 45 again. Hey, you guys can live in the region of Goshen where you can be near me with all your children, grandchildren, your flocks and herds and everything you know. And I will take care of you there. And then in chapter 50, he says, I'm taking care of you guys. It's all good. You have an inheritance you didn't earn. Now, what's amazing is this. Part of the reason that they didn't like Joseph is because Joseph was going to be, they were going to cut, he was cutting in line in their mind because he was being risen to the top guy and receiving Abraham's inheritance, the number one blessing. So they didn't like that before. So they kill Joseph or send him into slavery so they can get that inheritance. And you know what happened with Abraham's inheritance? The drought completely wiped it away. So what they had stolen, which wasn't theirs to have, is gone. And they don't have anything. And now Joseph gives them an inheritance they didn't deserve. Isn't that what God does for us? You know, we try to sometimes say, I'm going to do it my way and, and I'm going to get outside of God's will. And the Garden of Eden is all about that. I, God created this all for us. Then in the garden, we say, I'm going to do this my way and take what I, is not mine to have. We kind of do this when we get into sin. We get into the Ten Commandments. We get outside of these, you know, the way God called us to be. And we say, I'm going to do this my way and, and work it out myself. And I'm going to take from, from him. And, and, and I'm going to just kind of ignore all the gifts. That, and I'm going to do this my way. And then, and then we kind of see all that stuff rotten and spoiling. God said, no, if you, if, you, if you don't take, instead of you receive my blessings, then I've got an inheritance for you that not only goes in this world, but, but the one beyond as well. Now, in Joseph's story, it's absolutely amazing. Because I don't know another story that has history attached to it where someone goes from, you know, the, the, the prison to the palace. I mean, it's just it's in, in one day. I mean, he's president in basically one day. He's just no one's, uh, but, but uh, Pharaoh has more power. And, and how did that happen? And, and the only way it can happen is when God just elevates you up. And, and Joseph kept trusting that God was working. And every day that was maybe wasted in the pit, Every year squandered as a slave, all the fair, unfair breaks, all the struggles. Joseph, I don't think he looked at him like that. I think he, he probably wondered, God, where, what's going on? I think he just said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best right where I'm at. And all of a sudden, one day it all comes together. And, and some of us in this room have lost dreams. We have felt like there's some wasted years. And what did I do? And what's going on? And I just need you to know that God has the power to redeem those things. And that your struggle and turmoil in the middle of those moments, when you trust and surrender to Him, there are some things in store for you in the next life that are incredible and unbelievable. And as we trust, it's going to be good. And for those who follow God, no season is wasted. No struggle is in vain. I don't know if any of you ever watched Bob Ross. Remember Bob Ross? He's making a comeback with, with uh, even though he's passed on to the other side. And I remember sitting as a teenager, young adult, Bob Ross, you know, flipping the, fam, the channels, and then there's this guy. Big hair and talking. Like you need caffeine when he talks because he's just like, whew. And he starts 
doing stuff on a canvas and you're like, why am I watching this? Have anyone ever thought that when you were watching him? There's better things to watch, but you just find yourself watching and you're like, what's he? I mean, he's just like blotting stuff on there and like, what's that going to be? And pretty soon it's a tree line or a shoreline and you're like, this is crazy and mesmerizing and how can this be? And, and these random strokes turn into this beautiful painting and, 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 and sometimes we think with our own life, you know, how can that little blotch turn into anything good? How can this part of the canvas of my life, that thing's on there and there's no way God can make anything good of that. And then if we watch, and, and, and as you kind of go through life and you look back and, and you watch and you're like, I'd, I'd really wish that went to happen, but man, I learned a lot in that season. Or grandma came to Christ in that season. Or something happened over here and, and, and I grew so much that I, I don't know that, boy, I, Lord, I'm, I'm kind of, it's, it, I'm, I don't like it, but I'm still grateful. And, and you kind of again begin to see God kind of do the Bob Ross thing on us. And he's like, and, and, and Scripture calls it, we are his masterpiece. We're his handiwork. And he begins to, to weave through the evil and things that we can't believe happen to us. And we look back and we realize God doesn't waste our hurt. God doesn't waste our pain. That there are things that he can use to be a blessing to other people. And, 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 and some of us, you know, we're kind of ready right now to kick God off the project. We're like, this looks like a terrible painting at the moment, Lord. And, and uh, I think I can do a little better, but, but this is what it's on all about. Would you trust and surrender that God can begin to work in your life some things that, that you don't even understand right now and he can bring some things to pass and add some color you want to and add some things here and share some things and all of a sudden you wake up one day and, and there's things that are different. There's healing, there's hope, there's, there's things and, and, and it's powerful and, and if you let him, this is where it's, it's, it's tough, but he wants to take those wasted strokes that you're like, I don't know, your invisible years, your broken dreams and turn them into something better than you could ever imagine. But you gotta, you gotta be willing to let him do some work in your life and give him the brush back. And this morning, that's, that's what I just want you to know. That's who I wanna serve. We serve a, a master creator. And, and this is who I wanna follow and this is who I wanna, wanna be with because he can restore and redeem and bring hope in life. So I'm gonna ask you just to bow your heads and close your eyes for this part of the moment. And, and, and this morning... Let's kind of talk to you. If, if you kind of are grabbing hold of that brush and, and you need to surrender your life back to him because he can begin to move and create and restore and redeem and, and do all these things way better than we can. And, you, and you, you've kind of been like, man, I don't know that I've been doing the best job and things might look good on the outside, but on the inside, all this stuff's going on or maybe things are falling apart on the outside. And if you will give God the brush over time, not maybe in one day, but over time, you know, Joseph was, was in prison or a slave for over 10 years of his life. There's things that can happen that God can begin to move. And then one day you wake up and there's restoration and there's peace and there's hope. And Lord, through all of those things, Lord, you can move and you can help us to be, have peace in the middle of the storm, to walk with hope in the middle of what we're walking through because we can believe right now, even though we don't like our circumstance, that you are at work and you are moving and Lord God, that gives us hope for the moment. So I pray for anyone here who's like that, that they would just say, Father, I'm giving you back control. Here, you take the brush. And I'm going to do my part every day to live for you, but you take the brush. I'm sorry for taking it. I'm sorry for doing it my way, but I, I surrender to you, Lord. I surrender to you, Lord. Forgive me in my way of doing it. I thank you, God. Some of us in this room, we have positions of power. Parenting's one of them. Lord, our primary motivation needs to be love. We serve out of love. If we have positions of power, we serve out of love because we want to honor you and that changes everything about us. Help us, Father, to do that. Others of us today, we need to let some people off the hook. And just for a moment, Lord, we, just, we, we do that in this moment. We give it to you. We ask for forgiveness. We receive your forgiveness and we extend it to others. That's how it works. We thank you, God, for that. And Lord, others, we just need to remember Lord, there's an inheritance that we don't deserve, but boy, you love us so much and it is gonna be awesome one day to be in your presence. And Lord, every single one of us who are there, we're gonna be like, I can't believe this is what God had in store. And God, that moment is gonna be so amazing and so wonderful and so powerful. And Lord, you give us a glimpse into that ahead of time and we thank you. Thank you, God, for your grace and your glory and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen, amen, amen. All right, so we're going to transition into our, our, our offering here at the end of service, our Kingdom Builders Miracle Offering. And what I want to do is just tie in our story just for a minute or two into what we're going to do, and I have a couple of stories to tell you. Um, you know, God's working through people's lives, just like we heard about here, all around the world. He's redeeming their story. He's coming alongside of them. And sometimes we get to be the answer to prayer of other people's prayers. It's pretty, pretty awesome. And people all around the world are in needs of God's help and, and God's love and God's life. And like Joseph, he wants to use our gifts and talents to help people all over the world. So a few weeks ago, someone was coming to Evangel and they got lost, probably like some of you did today, trying to figure out how to get around all this construction. So it was one of those days where we sent out another thing saying, oh, here's what you try to do if you're there. And they ended up at Gomer's down here. Not every church person ends up at Gomer's, but anyway. And uh, they walked in and asked the clerk, do you know where Evangel is? And the clerk said, tell me a little bit more about the church, described it, and, and they, they said, I think that's the good one. That was their quote. That's what they said. And then the clerk said to someone, a customer, said, hey, do you know where Evangel is? And they said, oh, that's the good one for our community up here. Two people that had never been here, that was the reputation in a liquor store, basically right down here, about someone who got lost coming to church. And, 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 uh, and, and it reminded me when they told me this story, it reminded me of when Pharaoh looked at Joseph and said, I kind of see the Spirit of God on this person. And it reminded me that some people who've never been in this building, maybe to vote, I don't know, looked at what you are doing and said, there's some good stuff going on there. And to me, they're saying the Spirit of God is on those people. And again, not about me, not about our building, about you and what, what's happening and what we're doing, and I think that was pretty awesome. And, and they're seeing that. So our outreaches and, and weekly giving are the kind of things that turn into tangible things that other people get to see. And, and that was just a little great microcosm of what, what's happening here when we get outside of our walls. So people are seeing the Spirit of God in you, and, and just like with us, God wants to rescue and save people through all of us, through where you're at, where you're living, all those things. And then not just your family, not just the community, but people all over the world. And that's what's awesome about living in this day and age is we get to do that together. So Kingdom Builders, we, you know, we have so many people who are faithful with tithe and, and uh, regular giving, so thank you for that. It's, it's, just a, it's, a, it's the engine for all the church w things that we're doing and all that. But then Kingdom Builders, is there's also a group of people that give sometimes in an offering to kingdom builders that's, that's above tithes. And then there's others that give every month. They made a pledge for it and they give. So I just want to thank our kingdom builders team. So let me give you this in one sentence. Kingdom builders is this. It is our above tithe giving where we say we want it to go to frontline programs and outreaches that build God's kingdom as quickly and efficiently as possible today. That's it. So this year, I just want to give you a quick report. Our kingdom builders giving this year we have given, you have given, $281,459 as of last Sunday. That's incredible. So give yourselves a hand for that. <clears throat> thank you, thank you, thank you. On top of that, uh, we gave 164000 by the end of the year to missionaries, boots on the ground, monthly support to missionaries around the world. So uh, yesterday, our teens were in Springfield uh, at, at, at Fine Arts Convention. About 75 of them from, combined from both campuses were there. At the end of service, the, the teens of, of Southern Missouri District of the Assemblies of God, there was about 2,000 there. The most they'd ever given in an offering was like $8,000. So their goal was 20. Yesterday, they gave $63,000 as a group to missions to speed the light. <clears throat> our, group, our group gave somewhere between $15,000 and $2,000, $1,500 and $2,000. So when, when these guys are getting it's awesome. By the way, if you guys are giving today as well, Put KB Speed the Light and it'll go towards that. So you can see a list of all the things that, that we have been giving towards this year, plus a few others that we capture our, our attention throughout the year. And they're also listed in a card in the pew in front of you if you want to look at them. But the list varies from outreach programs on our campus to building at Archie and upcoming remodel projects here to food, food pantry stuff and the things we talked about earlier in the service to ministries that are doing a, a great job in our community that we want to partner with, uh, partnering with missions organizations that virtually kind of are in every corner of the world. And in a few moments, we're going to receive what we call a miracle offering. And you can begin to get that ready if you, if, you're, if you haven't already. But our challenge is this. Hey, would everyone do something? And, you know, if you, if you can't do it today, would you do it between now and the end of the year? But would everyone do something? 
Uh, my prayer is that we could raise another $100,000 between now and the end of the year. Based on the percentage given last year between now and the end of the year, that's a very feasible number, and, and it'll help us fund the rest of this year's goals and some of the projects that we'd love to get to in ministries. For a little encouragement, someone walked into my office two weeks ago, and they said, I was planning on doing something special just for me. It was going to be a little extravagant, and this was just for me. And uh, as I was getting the plans together, I couldn't get my mind off the project that you've been presenting at church the last couple of weeks. And I felt the Lord say to me, hey, instead of doing something for you, why don't you do something for me? God was telling me. So he said, I just can't get away from it, and I had to meet with you now because I'm afraid I won't do it. And, uh, but I know that God's asking me, and it's the first time I've really ever felt like this, that God's asking me to give $25,000 the kingdom builders for this, this project, that remodel project. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. And I, I couldn't believe that. Last week we had someone say, I'm going to give $10,000 uh, between now and the end of the year. So the first one is going to be now, between now and then the kind of the first part of the year. But, but we call this a miracle offering because it's, it's really not about the amount. But I'm just kind of giving you encouragement. Maybe we could reach that goal. But, but it's really about everyone doing something together. What I have found is this. If I'm in a car and they say, hey, let's go to lunch, it's hard for four of us to agree on anything, you know? Like, where are we going? I got, well, let's go. I kind of want this. I, and so that, you'll see that at Thanksgiving with your family. Like, what are we going to do? What movie are we going to see? And you're just kind of there forever. But when 11 and 1,200 people decide to like, in our whole campus and both campuses and departments kind of say, hey, we're all going to make a difference in something and we're going to all do something together on the same Sunday, that's pretty powerful. And I think something happens spiritually when people get on board for doing something that's not about them. Because what we're about to do is about, not about us. It will benefit at some level, but it's really about people we haven't met and needs that, that we don't even maybe even know about right now. And, and what we're about to do is, is very unique. And, and I shared this earlier. We only do this one time a year, and we're just asking everyone, hey, could you participate in some way? Because there's something powerful about doing this. And, and you can give by marking your envelope, Kingdom Builders, you can give change, you can give dollar bills, it does all, the, everything in this offering is going to Kingdom Builders. You can give online if you're watching. Uh, you can give through text, that option as well. You can see that on the screen. But we want to celebrate the good God is doing, the good that He's going to do through what's done today. So if you're new today, and you just, I, maybe you walk by as well, and, and, and you'll just say, I'm just going to pray for, for the offering today. But if God speaks to you, that's fine as well. So in a minute, here's what we're going to ask you to do. We're going to ask everyone to stand in a minute, and I'm going to tell you what to do. I told them what to do. It's hard to follow, so I'm going to show you what to do. All right. These are narrow aisleways. There we go. So if you're in this, you're going to go to your left, and then don't do this. Just come back, and then you can go back on the right. Does that make sense? So left to right, and we can do that. Otherwise... It'd be like football game out here, and we don't want that. Unless you're there. You guys can't go left. Don't walk into that wall. All right. So we got that. I just had to show you. Left to right. Drop it in. You got a couple buckets there. That'll help you. All right. So some of us are, are like, man, I'd love to do more than what I'm able to do. That's okay. Just say, God, hey, next year I'd love to do more. Some of us, this will be the best offering we've ever given. You're like, just thank God for you're able to do that. God has blessed us and an opportunity to be a blessing for others. And some of us, like some of the teens yesterday, is probably their first offering they gave to missions. Some of you today will be the first offering you give to missions. The Bible says this, where your heart is, that's where your treasure goes. And this will open the door, that will open the door for missions in a way that maybe has never happened for you before. And I hope it does. I hope your heart begins to notice something. So I encourage, again, everyone to do something. Size of the gift, whatever it is God's laid on your heart to do. We've, hopefully that's not a surprise if you're a church family. We've been talking about it for a month. But we're going to do a sizable gift, Jill and I, above our normal giving. And, uh, and if you're like, hey, I can't do that today, um, but I'll do something between now and the end of the year. My spouse isn't here today or I forgot. And you're, cause I, but because I have to walk by. You can just write IOU or between now and the end of the year. Or if you gave online and you're like, duh. I already did that. This right I gave online. That's fine, too. So you can all be a part of it that way. All right, let's stand. We should be ready. And we'll be done in just a couple moments here. So you're exiting to your left. Then you're going around and coming back in on your right. And then we'll lead you in a closing prayer in about three minutes. So God, we thank you today and we rejoice that you have blessed us. 
And God, you bless us so that we can be a blessing to others and then others can notice and others can see and, and our good works shine the light to the Father and, and this whole thing begins to happen and people who don't even go to church begin to say, man, that's a good place there. And, and that, this is, these are these kind of moments here because it allows us to get outside of our walls, Lord. And, and we do it through giving and we do it through going and we do it through volunteering and getting our community and in our schools, all that stuff. Lord God, but thank you that you have blessed us so that you've been working in our lives so we can be a part of blessing others. And I thank you that what we give today will turn into food and will turn into someone somewhere hearing the gospel. Your kingdom will be expanded and, and there will be things literally that come into existence that otherwise would not be because of the offerings that are given today, given in the weeks to come that have been given. And we thank you, God, for one Sunday a year where we get to do this all together and thank you, Lord, and bless this offering, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So as you feel ready, if you need a minute, that's fine, but John's going to lead us, and then we'll be closing in just a